the dawn of civilization. Primitive, dangerous, exciting. The handwriting is on the wall. If the human race is ever going to amount to anything, it needs the most civilized caveman I have ever seen. Ah, look, he's come out of his cave. Everyone has changed from Cave Dweller Music. I'm joined by Brendan as usual. And today we have uh, Patrick with us from Grave Next Door. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Really great to have you. Uh, do you want to tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do and uh, just introduce yourself to everyone? Oh, my name is Patrick Salerno. I'm the drummer and one of the founding members of Grave Next Door. We're currently based out of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, by day, other than music, I'm a uh, bail bondsman and a private investigator. Nice. Wow. That's awesome, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. That must be a pretty interesting gig. I was about to say that too. Yeah. Like, uh, do you have, uh, I do are here for music and stuff, and, but like, do you get to like have some, like, do you have some cool adventures from that? I have a lot of cool adventures. I'm in, um, I'm in two books as the cat, as a character. Huh. And, uh, I'm in one book as myself. So, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been doing it for quite a number of years. That's Was awesome. it a Stephen King book? No, it's by Bob Burton, uh, The Crimson Hit and Bullet Blues. I'm um, the uh, character Dev Shannon was based on me. And uh, the memoirs of, a tra- memoirs of a Bounty Hunter, tracked down by Walter Fernandez. I'm my, it's a biography, and I'm my, I play myself, or I'm written as myself. That's oh, awesome. Shit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get you to uh, send me a link to that, because I actually want to check those out. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, stuff. absolutely. Um, wow. How did you end up getting into that? Um. After the Navy, I really didn't have a lot of other skills and other shooting and destroying stuff. And so, uh, <laughs> and uh, I just, I, I just thought I wanted to hunt people. And uh, no one, no one would hire me as a bounty hunter because they were afraid of being all oh, ex military, you're going to be a loose cannon. So mm-hmm. I got a job as a bail bondsman first, writing the bonds. And the company had a problem with, uh, so many people that they couldn't recover. I said, Hey, why don't you give me a shot? And I put a team together with a bunch of dudes that I knew out of Virginia who were um, Navy SEALs. And we came up and we started cleaning house on fugitives. And um, it just took off from there. And I started making more money doing that than writing the bonds. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That is sweet. Um, Did you, uh, are you a veteran? Yes, I'm a Navy veteran. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, so how did you come into like sort of the music world? Is that, have, has that been going as long for you as this has, or is that a newer thing? Well, I've, I've been in bands. I've been in punk rock bands since I was 13 years old. Okay. And then um, when I was 18, I was going to Michigan State University. I was in a band that was uh, doing pretty well. And uh, I developed a drinking problem. And one day I, at a, before a show, I drove the van and misplaced it drunk and with <laughs> everybody's gear. So they kicked me out and I wasn't going to classes because I was just partying all the time. So uh, I just, I showed up at practice eventually and I saw another guy in my position. I was the singer in that band and uh, I was devastated. I said, you know what? Forget college, forget music. I'm going to go uh, home. So I hitchhiked home to Flint, Michigan. And then um, I saw Top Gun and then I joined the Navy. That's awesome. <laughs> how, yeah. how long were you in the Navy for? Uh, I was in the Navy for six years. Okay. And my, uh, my father-in-law was in the Navy as well. Cool. Went to, um, what's the academy? Um, Naval, he went to the Naval Academy. That, that's what the academy is called. Oh, that, um, that is a prestigious organization. Yeah, he, um, he was an aerospace engineer, uh, and then he became a naval pilot. Now he is a uh, FedEx captain. Awesome. So, yeah, interesting career transition there. But uh, you still keep in touch with people from the Navy days, or is that sort of like a different life to you at this point? From the Navy. Night. Yeah. I think we actually lost the connection there for a second. What was that? Sorry. Um, yeah, my two best friends from the Navy that contact me every day. 
Oh, that's awesome. And that's and great. we we talk every day. We were like, we were like the, uh, I don't know, man. We were the three amigos when we were in, and uh, music was a big thing when I was in the Navy. We had gotten into uh, rap and everything, and then uh, after the Navy, me and uh, one of my Navy buddies, we started a rap group for a while in the uh, in the early nineties. <laughs> really? And uh, yeah, we were going all around New York and just like winning talent competitions and stuff. And, um, what kind of style, uh, like rapping? Oh, uh, just like freestyle gangster rap, like grimy, like yeah, gang okay, star yeah. EPMD. Yeah. <laughs> that, awesome. that, that type of stuff, not like cor- corny stuff. And I ended up signing with a label out of a Manhattan and they brought me into the studio. I was the only one they wanted from the group. And I went into the label, into the studio, and they wanted me to do the corniest, like uh, vanilla ice, Marky Mark type stuff. And, <laughs> uh, and my lawyer was my agent, and he got me out of the contract within a week. <coughs> so that yeah. was my uh, <laughs> short-lived rap career. <laughs> yeah, that was that was my short-lived rap career. And <laughs> the funny thing was is. Um, I mean, this is the early nineties and the lawyer's like, look, he says, uh, you know, the problem with rap is there's no longevity for, for most artists. I mean, otherwise you got guys like, yeah, Eminem, the beastie boys, those guys are like, uh, the, the, those guys are anomalies, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And right. he said, he said, you're eventually, you're eventually going to have to, um, move over to rock. So, um, I started, t- I, I was like, well, we're going to make this a band. I'm going to play guitar. We're going to get a live drummer. And it was pretty much an early incantation of uh, like a Linkin Park type thing. Okay. You know, I, wa- I wanted to have one guy singing. I would be on guitar and uh, we'd have a drummer, a DJ and everything. But no one was seeing my vision at that time. And we just, you know, broke apart like most things do. <laughs> so you yeah. could have been uh, the OG Linkin Park before before they were and created that sound <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. It was I mean, because it, it was hard to get rid of my hardcore roots. It was hard to right. get rid of my punk rock roots. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask about like your roots. Um, as far as a musician goes, I mean, obviously you said that you were the singer in the punk band and then you were rapping and stuff. So obviously you're doing vocals for a long time and then you, you played guitar. What brought you full circle to drums? Well, my brother. <laughs> okay. Um, at the time, it was about 2012, 2013. Um, my brother, we're 20, we're 20 something years apart, um, about 20, 21 years apart. Hmm. And um, I was living with uh, a girl at the time who was a, in a big band, um, Darcy from the Smashing Pumpkins. Wow. And, okay. Um, she not she had brought a she had a drum set at her house and guitars and bass and stuff and uh she'd be like oh i want to learn guitar or whatever so um i'm like i'm not good enough to teach a guitar so my brother moved out with us and my brother i didn't know it was a really good guitarist and when he got on the guitar he put me to shame <laughs> and uh, I, I all i could play was like a couple black flag songs and that was it, you know, and I'd been playing since I was 12. I always wanted to be a guitarist, but I was better on the drums. My brother always wanted to be a drummer, but he was better on guitar. (laughs) So we had this drum kit there. I got behind the kit and it just, I know how to count and I know rhythm was always good at rhythm and it just happened. Um, I used to work a drum machine and, and had no problem because I understood it. So I just got behind the kit and it was a natural. And uh, when my brother started playing and then, you know, we're playing with Darcy and my brother it was just like, well, you know, this sounds really good. Mm-hmm. So we played, we would play for years together off just jamming, nothing to be serious, not starting a band or anything. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's a little dry. No, no worries. <laughs> Um, so, so that's, so that's basically how we started jamming. My brother moved away for a few years 
and I get a call their father's day 2018 and he says hey bro he says I got some crazy stuff going on in my life I'm either going to rehab or I'm coming up there and I'm starting a band and I'm like man I'm like that would be cool let's start a band so I go (laughs) why don't you come on up so he gets here he he dries out for a week right he dries out for a week and we're watching this show on Netflix called The Black Crows. And it's in Arabic, just with subtitles. And it's about these people that join ISIS, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so we watch it night and day. Like, there's like a million episodes, right? Um, and, and we're watching it. And by the end of it, by the end of like a week and a half, we're like, we pretty much know a lot of Arabic from just watching it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And like, yeah. And uh, it was a total immersion process. So the funny thing is, he says, all right, you ready? He says that that there was a a small Ibanez Geo guitar and at the house that belonged to my daughter. And we went and got uh, an amp um, at a pawn shop when I was out writing a bond, some like line six piece of crap. And we... And then he says, let's go to Guitar Center. He's like, you're going to buy a drum set. And I'm like, oh, man, it's going to be like a thousand bucks. <clears throat> so even though we live in a house, I don't want to drive the neighbors crazy. So I get this ele- electronic piece of crap, right? Mm-hmm. I played it for a week, and I'm like, this ain't going to fly. So I take it back. I buy a real drum set from the pawn shop. <laughs> and um, I took the thousand dollars, and I bought all good cymbals. Nice. <laughs> and then um so like let's let's write a song so the first song we wrote was about that show that we saw about isis mm-hmm. um called uh black crows it was about all these people who were joining it, it was actually a saudi arabian television show and it was meant to be a docudrama about all about what had happened to these people who were joining isis and how they got conned and the corruption right. within the organization so we wrote that song sand in the blood was about that television show. And okay. that was the first song we wrote. And, no shit. Just, and then we were like, the songs just started flowing. And, and it's, uh, we just fucking, it, it's good, dude. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's like, that's why the song feels so like, I guess powerful. It's got a, it's got a real like some substance behind the, you know, the themes behind it. Yeah. He uses some kind of scale. Arabic scale on it and okay. um and that's like the intro so and, and and then the rest of the songs were just like you know coming in and then once we got four songs together we started touring the open mic night circuits and just going <laughs> we're loading up my car and driving to every mic night within hours that we could go to and playing as a as a two piece and uh, who was on vocals? Oh, we didn't even have vocals. Okay, as just instrumental stuff. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we had we had no vocals, and then we realized people are like, "Hey, uh, it'd be nice if you had vocals. Um, otherwise, you're a jam band, and jam bands go nowhere." And <laughs> we're like, "We're like, well, we don't want to do that." And <laughs> yeah. So, so vocals were incorporated, and it just everything just started coming together. <laughs> So just to, uh, your, your brother's Anthony, right? Yes. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure uh, you had the same last name in like the credits and stuff. I assumed it was him, but um, yeah, we, we have a... the same dad, different mom. Okay. Okay. And then you brought on the second guitarist, which is Trey, right? Well, no, the second guitarist was actually Travis. Oh, okay. And, uh, and we had recruited uh, Darcy to play bass. So we were practicing with her mm-hmm. and then, she was like, we brought Travis in and then one day I had to go write a bond and then I come back and then I know it's Travis is on bass. And then they were like, yeah, Darcy put Travis on bass. She said, he, he's what we need. So I guess at that point, Darcy left the band and, you know, and then I'm like, well, okay, I guess Travis is our bass player now. And I mean, and Travis is a really good bass player. He's a great musician. He, he could play really anything. Mm. Um, so, 
So then that became, that became Grave Next Door. And you mentioned uh, before we started recording, there was someone else who was in the band previously as well, right? It was on vocals? Yeah, we had... Um, Travis had taken a break for a while and uh, we had... Um, we had James Morick was on bass and vocals. And uh, he originally didn't want to do vocals, but once we heard him sing, we're like, dude, you're doing vocals. What are you, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> It's like a um, Jim Morrison situation with the yeah. band was like, yeah, you're not getting out of it. <laughs> yeah. No. It ain't going nowhere. Yeah, but I mean, my brother, my brother was a vocalist before James. And then, um, you know, my, my brother could sing. He's been singing his whole life. Mm-hmm. As a little kid, he played piano, sing, sang beautifully. And yeah. um, it was just a matter of incorporating that with him playing the guitar and and getting up there and 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 building up the chops which he's still mm-hmm. working on so i mean it's it's been it's been a growth time for all of us and and i think that's good for the band because we're still growing as a band we're still getting better and better well that's yeah. good i mean it's yeah stagnation is is what kills a lot of bands so the fact that you're still moving forward is awesome yeah then we had trey lavish for a while as a second guitarist and um he's a good guy he's from the same town we're in okay and he was just um you know i, I don't think he liked touring <laughs> we're, 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 we are a touring band and we're, we're on the road more than we're home so i mean if and our, our thing is if like you can't tour this is the wrong band for you we're road where, warriors. Uh, you guys where are you guys uh doing a lot of tours out of um, we do a lot in Texas. We do a lot on the East Coast, um, down through the middle, um, the Carolinas. You know, we nice. really haven't been west of the Mississippi yet. So what's the, um, I mean, speaking of Texas, it just reminded me, what's the story behind the, uh, the, the single, As Heavy As Texas? Well, March, 14th, March, 15th, March 13th, we left for, um, we had some of the festivals we had to do down in Austin for unofficial South by Southwest showcases. Mm-hmm. Well, one was for like ripple music, another company, and they, they run all these, all the other venues down there. And there's a million of them run these uh, showcases for all these bands and these side festivals, you know, unofficials. And we were asked to come play. So we jumped on the road on March 13th. And if you remember March, that Friday, March 13th, whatever, you know, COVID had just hit the United States 2020. Right. And uh, so we, we end up playing to not a lot of people down in um, Louisville, Kentucky at the Mag Bar. And everybody's like, everybody's scared, They're watching the news. Um, the next morning, we're, you know, we're reading news reports and we're just driving around and my phone starts blowing up because I'm the one that manages all the gigs for the band. I do the managing work. And it's like, um, this, this festival's canceled. And every hour we had, we had like 15 gigs and like for the first three hours, um, four gigs had gotten canceled, but it wasn't enough to pull off the road. So we're like, no, 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 no. Then I got these promoters. We had a booker. The booker's like, hey, man, I want to know you guys are out there. Um, I want to know that you're going to make these things. I'm telling people grave next door. I go, no, we're road dogs. We're going to do it. We're going to stay. And by the time we got to um, Tennessee, our gig was canceled. And I ended up catching, we ended up doing a house show at Kelly Brick's house in Tennessee. She's like a big scene in Florida down there in the metal, in the metal community. And, uh, woke up that morning, my throat was sore. I had a headache. I felt like garbage and I felt, I felt like the zombie apocalypse of like, Oh, I better not tell anybody I got a scratch. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to turn, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I'm not saying anything to anybody. I'm trying not to cough. Um, we got to Texas 
a couple of days later, we had a gig in Arlington and I thought I was going to die playing the songs. Um, and uh, that, that night um, we got asked to play again at the same venue. They go, Hey, one of the bands canceled out. We got Floyd Vader coming in the next night. Would you guys mind uh, opening for them? Like, yeah, we got nothing else to go to. We got some stuff in uh, Oklahoma in a few days, but yeah, that's cool. So we ended up staying at this local dude's house, coolest dude in the world, this guy, Jason Hubbard. He brings us to Hubbard, Texas, where he lives. And we stay at his house and everybody's partying, having a great time. I'm in a room dying, just dying, going through rolls of toilet paper, coughing my lungs up. I'm wondering if I'm going to make it or not. You know what I mean? Because no one knows what this disease is. No one knows what it does. Mm -hmm. um, so... The next day, um, we had a different bass player at the time, a kid named Kyler. So uh, Kyler and Anthony go out. They're walking around. They find this voodoo thing with a squirrel's head on a stick and these beads and shit, you know? <laughs> and they're like, and that, that's in the song, voodoo squirrel's heads on a stick. And you find that. And I'm just like, hey, man, I go, in the day, I didn't feel that bad. I go, I, I just need to be in the sun. I feel like I need the sun. Let's go drive the van around. And I know Waco was like 45 minutes away. And I'm like, hey, I want to go see that place where get David Koresh got burnt down, <laughs> you know? And so I, I drive into Waco and we like to go to pawn shops and look for gems, you know what I mean? Like, like instruments and stuff that are like, you know, that you wouldn't find anywhere else that are real cheap. So we're yeah. going to pawn shops. Yeah, and it's just like the people were so different. Like we saw a cowboy that was dressed literally like the Marlboro Man with like, you know, skinny boots, like the red shirt. Yeah, he literally had a pack of Marlboros hanging out in the pocket. You know, they're like the <laughs> big Texan hat. And, um, we didn't find anything in those pawn shops but trash. Um, and then we wanted to get food. Everything had shut down because of COVID. And I was like, man, I was like, these are heavy times. I'm telling my brother and I go, we got to go back to the house, dude. I need to lay down. Um, I was, I was unfit for travel because I just was like so sick. We had to spend another two days there. And it was one of the heaviest times that we had. It was nothing but like disappointment. Um, but at the same time, you know, we were disappointed. Our shows got canceled. I was sick. We didn't know what was going to happen in the world. We watched the world shut down mm. and we were on the road and it just felt like, man, I really, we really wish we were home. And, and, and in the middle of this, you're in this, like this beautiful state, all this sunshine, big sky, you know, and the people, when we showed up to the uh, division brewery, in Arlington, that's the last place we played. The mm -hmm. people were like, thank you so much for coming here. We can't even get bands to play with, with the pandemic and everything going on. Um, we really appreciate you. And the people were so super nice. The hospitality to us in Texas was just amazing. So it, it was a great all around experience. Uh, you know, like what Jason Hubbard did and, you know, and, and and everybody else taking care of us while we were down there. Yeah. And then we just headed home. And so what if, so I got home, I had COVID repaired from the COVID. Um, I told my brother, I'm like, yeah, I go, let's, uh, let's jam. So we, we got, I got behind the kit and he hits these riffs and I go, and as he hits these riffs, I just came up with the heaviest Texas lyrics in my head i go dude you just made a song what i go i go let me record that play exactly what you did and then um i wrote the whole five minutes that's awesome i i because i was very yeah. curious about that one I, I read the lyrics and i was like i really want to know what that one's about but also <laughs> i just have to say i absolutely love the uh the artwork you got done for that single very cool yeah, Steven Yoda did a great job. I love working with that artist. He's amazing. Yeah. 
Is it the same person that did the um, yeah the, the full length, or was that someone else? That was Will Jennings from okay. Ghost Hello, another amazing artist. Ghost Hello, that sounds super familiar. Um, yeah, the, they're out of um, the, the, they're out of like the, they're out of like the uh, Canton, Ohio area. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I reviewed their last album, the Ghost Hello slash Night Goat, the split that they did um yeah yes. that was a that was a killer album actually i and that album was very cool as well well we were the opener for that that uh release party for that album the split oh, cool and you know i'm i'm at the merch table and i'm looking at the art and i had already paid for art a year earlier for our album mm. and i or like six months earlier and when I saw that, I said, no, we have to change. And I, well, I marched over to Will. I go, Will, will you please do our album? I go, could you? And, and this is what I want. And Will is just like, boom, he, he gave me exactly what we wanted. And Chris Bentley, Night Goat, that's a great band, by the way. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Are you still there? Sorry, sounds. I think it sounds. Oh like yeah, I I, I I paused so you could talk. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, it sounded like you were going to say something, so I stopped as well. <laughs> no, <laughs> Don't no, yeah, worry about like, that. Well, did we lose them? <laughs> no, it was a, that, that was a lot of dead air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, oh, that's funny. <laughs> we'll cut yeah. that out. It's a consequence of politeness. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I wanted to run this by you because I was very curious about this, but as soon as I heard like your music, the first band that came to mind for me is Life of Agony. Life of Agony. Wow. Yeah. Do you know them? Yeah. I, I'm a big Life of Agony fan. Awesome. Yeah. Dude, I, I, your music, something about it. I'm not sure exactly what it is. It might be like the guitar tone or the, the way you write the riffs or it might be like the vocal style, but something about it. That's, that's what came to mind the first time I heard your music. I was like, man, these guys are like Life of Agony. Yeah. I saw, I saw Life of, I used to watch, uh, Life of Agony over in Jersey when they would come over and play. Oh, really? So, That's sick. Yeah. I, uh, River yeah, Runs I love Red. those guys. It, I absolutely love their first album, man. R River Runs Red, that, that's a absolutely killer piece absolutely. of music. They're playing um, in Hartford on May 24th. I really, oh, wow. See yeah. No, they pop up on my Facebook feed all the time. Well, no, I'm not going to see them. I'm going to be like two days away from you. Ding dong. Oh, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm not spending any money. <laughs> Yeah, where uh, Brendan and I haven't actually met in person. Um, we've all, it's all been through the internet. So in May, we're actually going to uh, Maryland Death Fest together for the first time. So, oh, well, I guess uh, you're going to see us. You, you're going to be there. Yeah, we're playing there. You're playing in Maryland what? Death Fest? No, not Death Fest. I'm sorry, Maryland Doom Fest. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, okay, uh, that makes that makes sense. That would also be a really fun time. Yeah, yeah, and you guys should come out, man. When is that? Is that the same? Is that, that's in May as well? In June. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah. I was looking. Oh, man. There's a bunch of bands on that that look. Uh, it's going to be It's gonna be a killer time. I'm going to pop up the yeah. lineup. Let's see. Maryland Doomfest. It's too many great festivals. It's like that, that whole thing. It's like no one could tour for like two years, and then every band on earth just wanted to play. So there's these crazy festivals with insane lineups now. We ended up playing, we played Maryland Doom Fest last year. We slipped in under the wire because a band called out because of, of COVID. Mm -hmm. So they called us in. We went on early over across the street at Old Mother Brewing. And uh, we were like the third band up. And one of the, one of the headliners for our, our show that night, um, the headliners didn't show. JV Matson, he's the director of it. He comes up to us and he's like, um, he says, Hey, I really love you guys, man. He says, Would you guys mind headlining tonight? And I'm like, Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> we'll play the other half of our set. So not only did we open, we also headlined, um, got to headline at a festival. Oh, that's awesome. Played twice at the same festival in the same night. That's freaking awesome. And I heard Seems that's like, rare. Uh, Seems like you guys make uh, make friends wherever you go. 
Well, we do. I mean, it's, we have, we have a great positive attitude and all we want to do is play. That's all yeah. we want to do. I mean, we're, we're alive bad. Hell have you yeah. ever come to? Uh, I mean, I'm in the West Coast. I'm in San Diego. So if you ever down this way, definitely let me know, and I will come out. Well, I'm I'm definitely. Um, we have a lot of fans out on the West Coast who are wanting us to come out there to California and Vegas and Reno. So I'm like putting together something now, and I think that's probably going to happen in the fall. Awesome. awesome! I'll be there. Yeah, I and, just want to uh, go right up the coast. Same, so the other project that you're in, oh, the live drama for um, Tommy Stewart's Die Wolf, same thing, man. I, I've been waiting for, for that, that band to make it out this way for a, a while now. Um, Tommy doesn't go to the West Coast. I know. He can't, <laughs> I know. I've, I've been keeping an eye on it. I was like, oh, does he, he doesn't really seem to come here, does he? No, no, he doesn't even. I mean, really, like, um, he told me that he likes to concentrate on, you know, east of the Mississippi pretty much. Okay. on the eastern half of the united states yeah he was talking about like you know not trying to spread himself so thin that he couldn't like do good until everything that he's got going on you know yeah i mean he's a he's a musician's musician and he sets that corporate culture at the top of black doomba records mm-hmm. and and the label is really a musician's label um yeah. whereas like if you sign with another label and it's like, okay, like we could have went, we had offers from bigger labels, Mm -hmm. but we wouldn't have gotten the kind of attention that we needed that Tommy gives us. Mm -hmm. And that that we would just be one of many, many, many bands. Like, okay, here you go. Here's a hundred records. Go go sell some albums. You know what I mean? Right. And I think with Tommy, it's more like, uh, it's more like, of course, it's business. He's a great businessman, but he's your friend at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's a, he's a friend to the band. He's there to get you ready to go to a bigger label. Yeah, he, he said that. Te- he, he said that exact that. line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like you're in the minor leagues, and he says, look, you want to go next level, this is what you're going to have to do. Yeah. And um, it's constantly training, retraining, on the business end, he'll be like, Hey, you might want to take this course. You might want to do this seminar. And, you know, we're always throwing ideas back and forth. It, 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 it's a growth. It, it's more of a growth thing with Tommy. Yeah. Uh, you that's know? Awesome. Like that, that's like really like to be inspired all the time. You know what I mean? Like to have someone like literally just like, I mean, that's, that's really powerful and, and uh, that's meaningful, you know? Oh yeah, and it's 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 very genuine. He's a genuine dude. And yeah, he's super. Absolutely. He's super smart. Super smart. He, th- this is a guy that could have been like, if he didn't do music, he could have went to NASA. He could have been like a top ra- reigning like you know person in law or whatever. He could be on right, Supreme right. Court. He's got that kind of mind mm-hmm. where he's just he just he's truly he's truly brilliant. And just he talking just loves- to him and being around him. You get smarter being around the guy. He just loves music too much. He, he, we asked him on the, he said on it when he came on the podcast, he was like, uh, people ask me, what would I be doing if I gave up music? <laughs> he said, uh, I'd be dead. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That goes for, that goes for, I think everybody in my band. Um, my brother was asked once, where would you be without music? He says, probably dead or in jail. And, I think that's uh, a lot of people, man. That's that's music's one of those things that gives people's life purpose. Well, it, it's like this: music is music is the most powerful drug. I'm like, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't you know do weed or whatever. I don't. It's just I don't judge anybody who does that stuff. It's not my bag, but I can tell you this: <clears throat> I don't know why I'm congested today. Sorry, guys. No problem. But I can t- I, I can tell you this. I was 11 years old and I sat down with my Emerson little boom box, right. That I bought from shoveling snow. My cousin, Mark and I, he was 10. We sat there at the picnic table, in my grandparents' backyard. And we got a cassette paranoid by black Sabbath. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when we played that cassette more, most more than any other song on there, when I heard war pigs, 
I think, and I tell people this, something split in my brain. That did something to my brain. And it was the most amazing thing. And there's been a couple bands that have done that. Black mm. Flag, same thing. The Black Flag, my war album, split my brain. Totally reorganized it. My first Black Flag show totally reorganized my mind of what music was about. Yeah. And, and, and I'm talking, this was the lineup with Henry Rollins, uh, Anthony Martinez on drums, Greg Ginn on guitar, which Greg Ginn's always on guitar. I mean, mm-hmm. and then um, Kira on bass. And it was just like that kind of a power, that kind of showmanship, that kind of emotion. That's what, that's what rock and roll and music can do, can do. That's what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And that's what we try to do. That's what we try to do every night. You know, like when I'm back on that kit and I watch my brother and he's just thrashing away and his head's bobbing up and down. It just gets me motivated. I get motivated. The synergy is just like attack. And we want everyone in that room to feel it. We yeah. want to get, we want to give you your money's worth and more. We want you walking away you know, with your mind blown. Yeah, man. Whether it's 200 people or it's, you know, it's a bad night and it's just like the barman and the, you know what I mean? The door guy. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be a good night for them though. They'll they'll remember that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. The less people there is, the harder we'll play, you know? Right. Yeah. So I was kind of going to ask you this, but you kind of answered a portion of it right then. Um, We we like to kind of ask everyone who... I guess the most influential musicians and artists have been on them as a, per- both as a person and as a musician. But so you listed black flag, black flag and black Sabbath as two of any others. Oh yeah. Nirvana. Okay. And then, um, since I'm the oldest dude in the band and Travis, the bass player is my age, we go back to a lot of like psychedelic stuff, like the doors, cream, moody blues and awesome. stuff like that. And we get those, we get the softer dark elements mm-hmm. from that. And then we just bring it, bring it in and make it a little raw. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm the same with that stuff. I, I'm a massive like 60s psychedelic and seventies prog rock fan. Like, uh, outside of metal, that's the main stuff I listen to. My, my most of my vinyls are all the, from that period. Basically that stuff's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I had, I had the advantage of, when I was like eight years old, nine years old, was nine. Um, My stepmom, her sisters, they were getting rid of all their music they had from like the early 70s and the 60s. -hmm. And I had this mod, like it was was shaped like an egg um, (laughs) record player, you know? And, um, (laughs) And it was like, they gave that to me and that was the best thing they ever did. And I just sat there and I'm just jamming the Donovan, the Beatles, the Stones, the Doors, you know, everything that you could imagine to Moody Blues, Cream, and it's just filling it in. So what happened was I became way, I became way beyond my years musically that, than what I should have been. So when the crap would came out and the poppy stuff, I just never got into it. It never had any substance to me. Like, yeah. I call it guilty pleasure. I'll listen to a pop song and some pop Mm. songs are good. I'm not knocking it, but you know, where is the substance? Where's the deep? Where's the, Mm. where's the dark? And uh, that's where my tendencies, everybody in this band tends to lie. My brother being much younger, he gets a lot of his influences from like uh, Metallica. Mm. Um, He's really into the Melvins, um, which, which I am too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Um, right, ben. So, um, I mean, we all, we all come with all these influences, but, you know, I, I listen to a lot of uh, samba music, a lot of jazz, things okay. like that. Yeah, um, I kind of had a similar experience to you growing up as well, because my dad was like, uh, he listened to all this, that same stuff I just mentioned. So growing up, like, my mom doesn't really have much of a music taste. She kind of just listens to whatever, but my dad, my whole childhood was always playing like, 
Pink Floyd, Jethro Tell, all that stuff around the house, the doors. Um, so I, I kind of the same as you. I kind of came up on that stuff and I guess that shaped who I am as well from like a really young yeah. age. Listen to all that kind of stuff as well. Like Love... What was that, sorry? I was saying, like, I was Did you say stuff. Steely Dan? Oh, yeah. Steely Dan's great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, man. Like, it was on the radio the other day, and I was just, like, singing along, and it was just, like, so natural, and I'm just like, wait a minute. Like, I was just like, oh, yeah, it's, like, growing up on this stuff, you know? Like, I don't know, Steely Dan's one of those bands that's, like, they never, they've always been popular, but they never got, like, the recognition they deserve for how much good music they've put out. Right. They just have like so many albums and so I, many like, classic songs. Steely Dan is one of the best bands out there. Um, you, you mentioned they, Jethro Tull. Yes, love him. I saw yeah. them live in 88 in the Rome Coliseum. Ah, oh, jealous. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. That's very cool. My, uh, my, my dad took me to see them for my 18th birthday up at the, uh, the casino in um, New Hampshire there. Oh, wow. Hampton Beach, Hampton Beach Casino. Yeah. So, like, before I turned 18, that yeah, was a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Did you, um, I mean, did you actually hear that new song they brought out last year? No, I did not. I didn't even know there was a new song. Yeah. Yeah. They brought out a new single and it was actually like quality, like very good. I was very surprised. Well, because, like, you know, how a lot of those aging guys are kind of like some of them don't really have it anymore and they'll still put something out, but you're like, ah, oh, they shouldn't have done that. Not them. Yeah. It was, it was good. Nice. Yeah. I'll send. I'll send. You, I'll link it to you after this. Yeah, I'm definitely. I'm definitely interested in that. <laughs> it had a cool music video too, actually. Um, oh, dude! I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. And then, like, I'm, I mean, I kind of wish I could have seen like Floyd back when they were together. Back when they were like, you know, still Pink Floyd. Um, you know, had you know what's solo stuff. You know what's crazy about genre labeling? Everybody. You know, everybody has this idea of stoner rock, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. But like the original stoner rock band was Pink Floyd. Yeah. That definitely. was the band that everybody got stoned to. You know, mm -hmm. there would always be like a local movie theater and they would have two shows play. They would play and, and they would either play the Rocky Horror Picture Show first. Right. And then it was the wall would go on after that or vice versa. Right. But That's everybody right. would get stoned. Pink Floyd. Every stoner I went to school with was Pink Floyd. Every stoner I went to college with, their band was Pink Floyd. But then how do we have a genre now of stoner rock where no one sounds like Pink Floyd? Because <laughs> <laughs> they kind of got shifted into that psychedelic pocket. Like people would kind of push them in, away from stoner and put classified them as the whole psychedelic movement. So yeah, people, people distance them from that. Which you're, you're, it's a very good point. I didn't. I've never thought of it that way. They are. You, you know what I think happened to Pink Floyd? Pink Floyd were so good and they got so much radio play because they were so good that they, they, they would just became too mainstream yeah. for the whole, to even have the whole stoner thing attached to it. Right. I mean, I guess you could say the same thing about Sabbath to some extent too. It's like the whole stoner doom thing. Sabbath became, I mean, Ozzy Osbourne is like one of the biggest rock stars in, in human history. Yes. Um, so, but somehow they managed to retain it. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, so I, I was a kid in the 80s, right? And I was really, really mad about Ozzy fans because I was a big Black Sabbath fan. Mm -hmm. And I'd see these kids talking about, oh, Ozzy Osbourne, Bark at the Moon, and all this, all this stuff. I mean, I did like Crazy Train, and I'm like trying to explain to all these like kids, you know, that are my age. I'm like, dude, I'm like... That's like weak sauce. I was like, if you want the roots of what Ozzy Osbourne was doing, you got to go back. Oh, Randy Rhodes. And, 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 and I'm sorry, dude. Randy Rhodes really didn't do, do it for me like Tony Iommi does. Okay. Yeah, so, I agree. And I was like, that's like going <laughs> to use a drug analysis, analogy. Black Sabbath is like the hardest heroin in the world, right? Ozzy Osbourne's like, like a beer, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it was just so, it was so like corporate 
record 85, 80s, like, oh, we're, we're going to do a song, Ozzy. You know what I mean? And the way people bought that, bought Ozzy, and, and yeah, a lot of people got into that. It, it, it was a precursor to hair metal. It might have been hair metal. You know, I, I just don't, I just don't, I think Ozzy without Black Sabbath wasn't that great. And, and there might be a lot of people fight me on that. You know what I mean? But no, I, fully, I don't know. I, I get you on that. I, I struggle <laughs> to even, I personally, I love Dio. I love Dio's solo stuff. I love yeah, him. Man. I love him in rainbow. Um, but I don't, I struggle to think of black Sabbath without Ozzy as Sabbath. I kind of think of it as heaven and hell as like a separate entity mm. without him. I, I mean, I know that it was black Sabbath still cause it still had those other guys, but it just doesn't feel like black Sabbath without him. No, yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And my bandmate, Travis, would totally disagree with me mm-hmm. on that point because he, he loves it. But to me, I'm like, I mean, uh, it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a purist. I'm a purist. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's in no way a diss on any of the albums that Dio put out. They're solid. Like, they're fantastic albums. If there had been any other band that he had done with that, I would love that band. It's just like, once you, it's just, you're comparing it to Ozzy, though. That's the only thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. But you can't take Ozzy. You can't take Ozzy. It's like, it's like taking Henry Rollins out of Black Flag. I mean, yeah. come on. The Rollins band, even, even Rollins himself said that the Rollins band wasn't that great. Henry Rollins didn't shine in the Rollins band. He right. shined in Black Flag. I mean, right. dude, either the, either the chemistry is there, is it not? And these guys can't lie to themselves. I mean, come on. We saw Van Halen with you know that disaster of Sammy Hagar. Yeah. I can't even remember the Gary Sharon years. I don't even know what they did, but like, come on, you're going to pair like right now, you know, that song right now, whatever you're going to mm-hmm. compare that to like, you know, Panama and like unchained and like all the good shit before jump. You know, I, I, I meet people who actually prefer Sammy Hagar's era. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like something's wrong with you. That's dude. I, I don't know how you, <laughs> how can you say that? Dude, I Stanley Hagar, God bless him, man. He's still out there. He's doing it. He's got his tequila and everything. <laughs> but like, I, it's he's a guy that like, I mean, I love him on the heavy metal song where he's singing, you know, to the soundtrack, mm-hmm. you know. But like, when I was a kid, that one, two, three lock box, I can't drive fifty five. It's like he came off as like if heavy metal, if heavy metal had a basic dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it was like, it, 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 it was like he was the Starbucks of heavy metal. <laughs> Is it the all-inclusive metal? Yes. It's, it's funny that you compared him to a, like a, a food chain though, because he, he did open Cabo Wabo. Yeah. And that's a <laughs> stupid name. Cabo Wabo. Come on. <laughs> but you know, that's, he's like, he's like really California. And that's a California thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But there's some people that like, I appreciate them more as like a businessman than I do a musician. Like, um, Dude, he's a great businessman. Yeah. He and, is. I'm, I, and I'm sure he's like, and I, 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 I watch interviews with him and I'm just like, you ruined the hell. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, um, it's like Warren, uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett, that guy's music, like, who gives a shit? But he's a, he's like, he's so rich. The guy was a, yeah. a genius. He like took a couple of hits and turned it into like a, an empire type thing. I know like the cheeseburger paradise thing and like tired heads. Like, I don't even like that's, it's not even yacht rock. No, I don't even know what you call Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy Buffett. It's, it's like in rum rock. Rum rock. <laughs> so like, so like when I was in my rap career going thing, right. We, um, we used to hang out cause we were living in Jersey. You know, that's the place where partly I'm from. And uh, we were down in the Jersey. We were hanging out with all these preppy kids, right? Talking kids that live in like huge, huge mansions. You know, we weren't kids from mansions. Let's let's put it that way. And um, we were street kids. Grew up with nothing. And uh, we're hanging out with all these people. And these kids that we're hanging out with, that we're going to college with, like they're wearing these like tan Bermuda shorts, these like, golf thing these boating shoes and we're like playing like you know public enemy form the beat we're like yeah we're going to the beastie boys man we're going to the check your head like tour you guys want to go 
like, oh man, no way. They're like, we're really in the buffet. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. what's that? <laughs> and like, they start playing the music and I'm like, dude, like, did you, like, that's your dad's music. Just how, do you, how do you even like, how do you even like, uh, you know, how, how do you associate with this? Like, no man, this is what we like. So and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, and, and I'm not, I don't judge anybody for what they like, dude. Everybody's different. And I was just blown away. Then they explained the whole parrot head thing to me. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Go to the islands. But that was their life, man. You know, have you ever watched the show F is for family on Netflix? Oh yeah. We, we worship, we worship that show in our house. That, dude, I, you I just made me think of that whole, a uh, couple times. <laughs> You just made me think of that whole season where, um, what's the kid's name? Um, the the guitar kid, his son. Oh, I forget his name. Yeah, he joins like uh, Vic, the neighbor, puts him into the um, the 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 yacht rock band when he he uh, he loses his job at the radio station. They hire him back, and there's like this is the new sound. They call the radio station the Queez. Oh yeah, dude, that was an off. That was awesome, and he's like. And he's like trying so hard to fit in to wear the captain's hats. Now. Yeah. <laughs> and he sings that song about catamarans. Yes. But that's <laughs> so true. That's so true. Because like a lot of that yacht rock, like I listened to it on Sirius XM. It, they, on Sirius XM, they play it from Memorial Day, sorry, Labor Day to two weeks past Memorial Day. Right. And the way I heard about it, they have this DJ that comes on and he says stuff like, Yacht rock. Don't call your kitchen. Don't call your kitchen a kitchen. Call it a galley. It's way more yachty. And I'm like, because I'm gonna listen to like you know the like um the the lithium channel. That's where I live. And I hear it, and I'm like, they're having a commercial for it. And I'm like, what's that? Channel seventy. And so I I go, and then guess what? They're playing like Steely Dan. Mike, Michael McDonald. I'm like, I'm down with that stuff. But Ooh. like, what was Michael going up? Uh, what was what? Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say he's got the voice of an angel. Yeah. And, and like, if you watch, if you if you listen to those songs, he's right. So as I'm like getting into this Yacht Rock thing, you know, and just like looking at it and studying it, F for Family comes on with that whole thing. And I'm yeah. like, why did everybody go crazy over boating back then. It's not like the whole nation went out. You'd think everybody and their brother went out and bought a sailboat, you know? <laughs> Kevin. His name is Kevin, the son. I just, Kevin. It just clicked for me. Oh, yeah. And he, he saw it. <laughs> yeah, Dude, exactly. That's, that's like the kind, that guy, that's, uh, that's my brother and mine. That's the kind of dad we grew up with. That's like that the same, boomer, like the boomer. I'll throw you through a wall. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dad didn't yeah. mess around. Um, so we actually are almost out of time here. I just, I've just looked at the clock. Um, we've been chatting for longer than I thought we had. Brendan, did you have any uh, questions you wanted to ask before we have to wrap things up? I guess. Um, I mean, besides seeing like Black Flag or anything like that, like, um, is there any like cool, awesome shows you got um, that you had like seen before? Like, some old, cool stories and that? Um, old school stories? Yeah. Of shows that I saw? Yeah. Like back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, one of the best shows I ever saw was Run DMC. Nice. Run DMC with. Um, who was with them? Run DMC with Public Enemy and Kid Rock. When Kid Rock was like about 15 or 16 years old. Back before Kid Rock became the meme. Yeah, exactly. Um, I saw a lot of great... Uh, I saw the Red Hot Chili Peppers when I was 16 years old, 15 years old, for $3 in East Lansing. Right around... Right... Uh, right after Hillel died when they would play with the um, socks on their penises. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, when they were more funk than anything. Yeah. Right. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, Space I mean, I saw. Heavy. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw a lot. Of, I saw a lot of good shows, but uh, the Henry Rollins show. Oh, sorry, Henry Rollins show. The Black Flag show was really good because I snuck into that show, and because uh, it was a twenty-one and over. And this was at Rick's American Cafe in East Lansing. Um, someone, these skinheads were there causing trouble, and they had thrown me into Henry. And Henry and I rolled together, and um, we ran into the kit, and we like uh, busted up the kit a little. They had to, they had to put the kit back together. And I thought Henry was going to beat my ass, but he saw the people do it, helped me up, make sure I was okay, put me back down, made sure those skinheads got thrown out of there, had some words with them. And uh, he made sure I really wasn't messed with the rest of the night. He said something like, no one mess with this kid, you know? And, and I, was th- I didn't like him saying kid because I was afraid they were going to like uh, throw Sorry, me yeah. out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was like... That was probably one of the best nights, best nights of my life. That's awesome. And I was only 16 years old. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been to so many shows that uh, could be considered uh, great, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the and Beastie then- Boys. The Beastie Boys in, uh, saw them in a small bar down in Long Branch for the Check Your Head tour. I mean, small bar, 200 people. Um, and... Uh, Firehose with Mike Watt opened for them. Huh. Actually, and, I know them. Yeah, I mean, if you get Mike Watt, because Mike Watt was from the Minutemen, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's like you're having Mike Watt, Mike Watt, and then you get the Beastie Boys, then it's like, come on, man. Like, that, 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 that was an amazing night, too. Mm-hmm. Okay, I guess the reverse of that question is, with your band, if you could play with anyone... Who would it be? Anyone? Uh, it could be, okay, two parts. One, like a, a dream one that could be dead or alive. And then a, a realistic one that like maybe that could happen someday. Mm. God, we talk about this in the band all the time. Um, I would say, I would say Monolord because they're one oh, of I just, my I just saw bands. them like a week ago. Oh, it's so good, yeah. man. It's such like, a good band. Yeah, I, like. I had tickets to see them in Detroit, but I had co- I came down with COVID oh, yeah. for my third time. Oh, man. That's my brother good. actually has COVID right now for his third time. Huh. What? I, I haven't had it I yet. I didn't think it existed anymore. Are you kidding me? We're like, the grave next door is the COVID band. We've, <laughs> yeah. we've gotten COVID so many times. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah if, if I could play with any band, any, any, any band, but dream bands, it would probably be with Nirvana. Like uh, back it's, with it's, the, back in the day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 The, 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 they're top shelf. They're one of the top shelves in my book. What do you feel like? What do you think about um, Alice in Chains? Alice in Chains is amazing. Alice in Chains is doom metal. Mm. I, don't know, I I always get like they kind of like I don't know they're one of those bands that straddles like a bunch of different styles like they kind of they do but they got like some grunge influences I don't know they they were kind of all over the place but whatever they are I love them they were well, that's heavy, good. dirty and melodic that's what we try to be mm-hmm. that's that's, yeah. that's what we try to be we we don't try we my brother and I we didn't even know what doom metal was what what happened was is we made a CD through our like little solo scarlet home recording thing and brought it to a friend and we played it for him these other musician dudes and they were like yo you guys are doom metal we're like what's that (laughs) and the only reason we knew about bands like sleep and like all that was because we my brother and i would work out and and we we had pandora we put on black sabbath so we'd hear like stuff like sleep and monolord um uh, weed eaters that, that they would play stuff like that in there uh-huh. and we're like dude check out all these bands and um and we're like doom metal that sounds pretty cool we're like yeah we'll take that but it's not <laughs> like it's not like we sit down to write oh we're gonna write a traditional doom metal song and it's got to sound like this and it's got to be yeah. this tempo no man we're gonna write whatever we feel like and whatever's inspiring us at the second and if it sounds like this 
or that, and, and it's out, outside of the genre, so be it. We, we don't like genres. We don't like being labeled in a genre. We don't like the tagging. It helps people find what they like, but it also holds people back too. Right. right. I mean, from our perspective as a site like we are, it, it's like it's a super useful tool for us to, you know, direct people to what they want to listen to. As well, a reviewer, that's the you, positive you, side of it. Yeah. As a reviewer, you want that. But from the opposite side, from a band's perspective, I can definitely understand how you can get pigeonholed or, you know, people will like push you into a box type thing with using those labels. Right. Yeah. I mean, look at co- Corrosion of Conformity. They play doom metal festivals all the time. We really mm-hmm. can't say they're doom metal. They yeah, haven't been doom metal sludgy. the whole time. Why, why sludge you? Um, yes. So the first time, so my brother and I, after we started playing together for a few years before we started great. You there? Yeah, yeah. You dropped out for a second, but you're back. Yeah. I hit something on my phone. I'm sorry. No, um, no problem. My brother and I, before we started playing, after we started playing for a few years, a friend of mine played a Caius album for me and I yeah. go, I go, what's that? And they go, it's Caius. And I'm like, and these, this person was friends with Caius. And I'm like, I go, Oh my God. I go, that's what my brother and I sound like. And like, we'd never heard Caius before. And I remember calling my brother up. He was living in Florida. And I go, dude, there's this band called Caius, you know, from long ago. I go, they sound like us. He says, dude, that's really cool. You know? And uh, I don't know, man, it really helps because um, he's the only guitarist I've ever played drums for. Mm. So the whole thing is um, when he's playing, we have like this unwritten thing that's going on. We're like we're on the same wavelength, you know, because we're related. And so a lot of it is in intuition and I'm so used to his playing. I know what he's going to do and he knows what I'm going to do. So it's so easy for each one of us to clue in on the other and yeah. just, and, and just go. And we're both ADD really bad. So I think that works to our advantage in this band and and i always know like his flow you know what i mean and then like i can always i can always tell when he wants to pick up and slow down and then he can tell when i want to pick up or slow down or i want a tempo change because we always have the ebb and flow and that's um, one have you ever been out to uh palm desert palm desert where's that uh, it's in California, Southern California. I, I was at 20, I drove through 29 Palms and um, Death Valley once. Yeah, right near there. So it. It's like, it's kind of near there, but I, I bring it up because you mentioned uh, Caius and that whole sound. Um, that yeah. whole style all started from that little town, which is crazy. Um, Palm Desert was like the birthplace of desert rock. And you had like so many massive and awesome bands that came from that tiny little desert town. Oh man, is that where Desert Rock came from? Yeah, yeah, it is. There's there's a bunch of bands like Yawning, um, Yawning, what are they called? Yawning Man. Yawning Man, yeah, Yawning Man, um, Caius, uh, Brant Bjork. Yeah, Brant Bjork. They're all from that. That all from there. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, I was actually there on the weekend, um, and uh, it's just like it's hard to believe when you go there because it's, nowadays it's like this resort town full of spas and hotels and stuff but it's like oh, oh this this massive rock legacy there which is super cool mm-hmm. I, mean, I bet most people there don't even know about it yeah is there still a scene there for that or not really yeah i think there is like the, a lot of those bands still go out there and record and stuff like yawning man uh just recorded an album right near there one of the national parks like uh they did mm-hmm. a live album in the desert they recorded out in this in the desert which is super cool um, you know i i've heard yawning man before and they're really good they are mm-hmm. great band. Yeah, I love them. So yeah, um, yeah, that's didn't mean to go off on a tangent on that, but I just thought you might find that interesting if you didn't know that. No, I um, I do find that interesting. I think that we're gonna head out. We're, we're probably gonna head out west in um, probably in September because I was just I was just thinking today. I'm like, man, I'm like, you know, because we book our tours six months out. And we've just been busy writing and everything. And we do need to support this album that just came out. And I'm like, and I'm like, man, I really, really want to go west. And uh, I, I don't want to go out to, uh, I don't want to go out there in the summer when it's real hot, you know? Oh, dude, it, 
I, uh, I can tell you because I went camping out there <laughs> in uh, the middle of summer and uh, it was like very, very bad decision. Uh, it gets stupidly hot. It was like 118 or something. Um, yeah, that's not conducive with me living. <laughs> bad. I, I went to this gas station near Death Valley um, and uh, the, the buttons on the pump like burned my finger. <laughs> It's, it's, it's gross. No, people shouldn't live in that heat. I had this fugitive I picked up in Manhattan, right? And uh, I had to bring him to L.A. County Jail. He refused to get on a plane. He didn't speak any English. He was this Chinese dude, right? Mm-hmm. And I had to bring him to L.A. And there was a lot of money involved. And there was three of us. And every time we stopped at a gas station, this guy tried escaping. And when we got to Death Valley, uh, we were driving. I had a rental car. It was a, a Dodge Alero or something like that. And Oldsmobile Alero, whatever. Had a rental car. It was so hot, so hot when we were going through Death Valley that I had to pull up to a next a truck and ride in its shadow <laughs> in order to stay cool in the car because the air conditioner couldn't keep up with the heat there. And I was just like, but here's the funny thing. Dude, at the time, you remember the Nextel phones? Like the big Nextel phones they had that had the chirp and everything? Uh-huh. Yeah. On them. Well, you would be in Manhattan with whatever cell phone you had, and you'd have horrible service, right? Here I am in Death Valley with the best service I ever had in my life <laughs> on my phone. And I'm like, <laughs> go figure, right? Who's out here? Uh, how does this even work? Sucking it up. Yeah, but I, I remember by the time we got to LA, I couldn't wait to get rid of this guy. <laughs> Dropped him off, and that was just a. And we stayed out because I I surf, well, I bodyboard, and one of my partners surf. My brother's a surfer too, and uh, we ended up staying with, at a friend's house in Santa Barbara. And every day we would go down from Santa Barbara to Malibu. So we stayed there for two weeks. I never wanted to leave. I pretty much was like, dude, California has got to be for me. But at the time I, I couldn't justify move out there. It's, it's a tough one for me. Cause I, I mean, I, I moved here uh, from Australia like two or three years ago now. And like, it's a love hate relationship. Just it's a beautiful place. And I love so much about it, but just the cost of living is just absolutely insane. Yeah, it's too expensive out there. It's so expensive, man. It's crazy. Uh, like, this, like the, the prospect of ever buying a home is like, <laughs> yeah, um, it's crazy. But uh, we uh, we better wrap things up. So I just want to ask you one final question, uh, which was, is there anything that you want to let people know about anything that you have coming up? Um, no, our album just came out, Sanctified Heathen, um, March 18th. It's available on Bandcamp. Um, check it out. Um, we're going to be playing Maryland Doom Fest. We're going to be playing, um, and that's in June. And in May, we're going to be at the Kraken Fest in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been awesome chatting to you. Um, You're welcome. If you do another album in the future, feel free to hit us up and come back on and talk about that one. You got it. We'd love to. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening and uh, tune in next time for our, our next guest.